Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with the town of Torbay's mayor, Craig Scott. The beautiful town of Torbay is located on the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland and Labrador. A vibrant, evolving community of over 7,000 people, Torbay has a long and colorful history that dates back to the 1500s. Now, a unique storied community with an exceptional quality of life, Torbay has so much to offer, from their history to their people to their bright business future. This is Cross Border Interviews with Mayor Craig Scott. Mayor Scott, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start to learn about who Mayor Scott is. And I want to go back to sort of the beginning, if you don't mind. And I want to start by asking the question, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Um, you know, I I think that I've I've always had it. And, you know, even even as a young whippersnipper kicking around here in, in Torbay when I was playing softball and stuff, we volunteered to do bottle drives and some things to, to raise money for our ball teams and stuff like that. So I I think it probably started then. And I was high school president at my high school here in, uh, when I was in grade 12. So that was something that uh, I guess my first foray into getting elected for something. And uh, even in my earlier years, I remember in, in grade nine in school, I attended an International Student Leadership Institute, uh, uh, I guess, retreat training type thing. It was for a full weekend. And uh, I did that in grade nine, 10, and 11. It was something that I uh, I really enjoyed. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I like people. And I like to talk to them. I like to find out about them. And, and I'm a I'm pretty personable type of person, at least I've been told. And, and, and you know, when, when people tell you those things, you kind of, in a, you know, you take a look at yourself inside and, and see what it is that they're trying to, what they see. And, you know, you should uh, accept that and, and, and accept it as a compliment and then try and, and work with those abilities that you have and, um, you know, put it to more use. And then I think that I moved away from here when I was 21. So I, I myself and my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, we moved to Ottawa in uh, 1998. And, uh, you know- Who brought you there uh, if you don't mind oh, me asking? Oh, no, I'm sorry, 1991. Oh, wow. We moved, we moved away. So what brought and you to Ottawa? Gone. Yeah, yeah. So we were gone for uh, six years at that time. Then we uh, we came back home, and of course we had uh, visited and stuff amongst th that time. Then we decided we want to start a family. We came home. We built a house. I went back to school at that time at uh, 28 years old, and uh, did a three year program at Kona in uh, program analyst. So I I changed completely. Uh, professions at that time I was working in the overhead door business and, and doing airport hangers and stuff like that so it was a it was a big difference for me to go back to school for three years with a bunch of I call them kids they were 18 years old at the time most of the people in my class and I had 10 years on them and a what seemed like a lifetime because I'd go to school in the morning at eight o'clock and I'd stay there till five pick my wife up from work drop her off and I'd have all my work done. And and I remember some students in my class asking me, you know, how come you spend so much time here? You're here all day. I said, listen here, I don't have time when I go home to do homework. I had to have everything finished before I go home. Because at the time, my wife was, uh, was pregnant. We were building a house. So, you know, there was a lot of things in my life that were happening at the time that, uh, you know, it's it really taught me how to prioritize and really focus on, on what's really important. So after that, that, four years later, we up packed our bags, sold our house, and moved back to Ottawa again because, uh, for a job because I couldn't uh, I couldn't 
get a job here in my new uh, my new role. I had a few, and and uh, but the opportunities were there, so I left in May, and my son was September, October, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. He was eight months old at the time. And I left and uh, went and stayed with my sister in Ottawa while I looked for a job. But I tried from home first and you just couldn't, uh, couldn't, it's hard to get a job somewhere when you're not there to be able to answer phone calls or go for an interview or whatever. So I went up and stayed her, with her for a few months, slept on the couch. And, uh, you know, eventually I was lucky enough to land a job with Revenue Canada as a database administrator. And uh, four years of that, and we decided we were going to move home again. So we sold our house in Ottawa and we moved back home and and uh, and built another house here. We had just had a daughter, so we had two we had two children. And uh, shortly after that, I got the bug for what was going on in the town. And I. Uh, do you mind by, I'm going to interrupt here for yeah. a second because I want to ask an important question before you get to this part of the story because I think I know where you're going. Yeah. Prior to, um, assuming this is about the 2013 era when you decide to put your name forward for counselor, had you yeah. considered running for council prior to that? Had you experienced a moment prior to that, whether it be going through school, because you seemed like to be a busy guy during this sort of former life moments of your time. And right. Sort of in 2013, you decide to put your name for it. Had you thought about it prior to that? I did. I <laughs> thought about it in the uh, the prior election to that one. And my wife said, no way. <laughs> because, well, we were, so that would have been 2009. My daughter would have only been four years old. and My son was seven. And... We had a lot on the go. I mean, she was getting ready to go to school. And uh, like I said, you got to figure out what your priorities are. And at that time, my priorities were obviously my, and it still is always my family. And uh, I kind of tossed it around a little bit because at that time, I had started blogging. And I had a blog called Torbay Today and I had a lot of uh, a good following on it. And it was something that I had done prior because when I lived in Ottawa, I had two blogs. One was called All Things Ottawa. It was about Ottawa municipal government. And the other thing was called All Things Newfoundland, that I used to write stories about what was happening back home. And uh, through that, I actually got contacted by a guy that was in somewhere in the States in New York. And he had a website called St. John City Times at the time. And he contacted me, asked me if I want to write stories for him. So I did. So that's something that has always been a passion for me, writing. And, and uh, so I kind of adapted that to what was going on in the town. So I started this blog and then I started coming to the council meetings. So I came to the council meetings. I'd sit in the chambers every day, every meeting almost for four years while I was writing my stories. And when I first started off I was I mean I did I did it by the seat of my pants right I came in and looked at what was going on made my own impressions of uh, of what I thought and wrote my stories and it was widely followed by the members council at the time and I don't think they were very happy with me when I first started and I can understand because I didn't always have my facts right uh, even though I tried but then I started to develop a relationship with the uh, with the staff here at the town, and I, I I knew members of council. I knew the former mayor at the time, so before I write my stories at that time, I would send it along to them, and I would ask them, "Is anything I'm saying here not correct?" So so I would I get a better understanding of of how things are working, and I said, "You don't agree with me, but is it factual?" Yes, and so then. From that point down, I started to get better at it and uh, started to understand the issues more. Uh, started to have a greater appreciation for the people that were sitting on council and sitting around a table making those decisions. And I kind of learned from there how the dynamic of a council works. And, and But you really can't tell 
until you get in there. So that was it. And then in 2013, my, my uh, kids were a little older and I, I made the decision at that time that I was going to run. And uh, I did, I did my homework and I, and I wrote up a, a flyer and put it in the mail and did everything you're supposed to do when you're campaigning and went around, knocked on doors, did, did all that stuff. And, uh, I really enjoyed that part of it, to be honest. The reason that I that I ran was because, as I mentioned, in 1991, I moved away. And at that time, in our town for recreation-type buildings and stuff, I mean, we had a softball field, and we had this old Kingsman Center, which was a small facility built back in the early 80s it was it was tiny and we just did not have the infrastructure to be able to do big events which my mar my wedding was a perfect example i got married in church in torbay and had my reception in st john's so i guess i didn't see much change in the town from 1991 till 2013 when I decided that I wanted to run for council and I had some ideas in my head of things that we wanted to do and uh, very fortunate for me when I when I did get elected in my first try uh, the mayor at the time Mayor Tapper he gave me some really nice assignments committee assignments on council public works and planning which were two of the, the bigger ones for in terms of doing things. And I remember the, one of the first things I asked them, were we allowed, could I put trails in public works? Because they had traditionally been in recreation. He said, yes, why? He said, I want to build some trails. So then, from then on, I mean, in our first term of council, it was like a, it was a whirlwind. We accomplished so much in those four years that you know I, I i couldn't even dream that it would have been possible we started building uh uh grand concourse standard trails we built a trail around one of our ponds we built a new municipal depot you know one of my first things i did was negotiate the uh, land purchase myself and another counselor and our staff to build that depot and uh, that was one of the things that were tasked to me. And, and uh, we did that. We built that building, a new $10 million or $11 million uh, municipal depot, which was badly needed because we were only working on an old garage behind the town hall here. Then, uh, you know, the next project we started on was a new community center. Oh. And then over the next few years, we built that. You know, it's a 18,000 square foot uh, gym and multi-purpose rooms and splash pad and skate park all the things that uh, you know a community our size should have and then uh, we built you know like i said trails and recreation and it was so uh, i guess rewarding and then we renovated the town hall here you know full renovation from top to bottom and put all kinds of new technology in for streaming our meetings live and and you know i'm i'm really proud of all that and and how we go about communicating what we're doing out to the public it used to be you know and look I, I i never ever speak badly about councils that were here before me because i always say they did the best they could with what they had at the time and and i think that uh, the growth that we experienced in the prior councils before i ever got on council was tremendous and I commend the council for being able to facilitate that, move it forward, and and the town grew so much, but our infrastructure didn't keep up with the number of people that were coming in. So, I'm I, you know, I look back at those first four, five, six years when we finally were able to complete the community center, and the town hall was renovated and and all that stuff, and I and I say, you know, people can spend. 20 years on a municipal council 
And if they accomplished one of those things, they'd be doing really well, you know, and uh, we were you, fortunate enough to be able to do all those in about five, six years. So, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of that we were able to do that. And of course that uh, I'm only one member of that seven person and I don't even, and seven is not even the, the right number. Yeah. There are seven people that sit around the council table. But the number of people that work behind the scenes in the office and, and really do the work, you know, it's it's really uh, I think it's 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 a great accomplishment to be able to do that. You have been at the chair uh, at the chair of the, the council for some time now, since 2017, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong here, when you were first elected mayor and yeah. you have seen some major changes throughout the year. And I, and I say this with respect and I say this with all uh, diligence to the position you hold. Change comes with sometimes an uh, air of negativity from residents. And you you can imagine, I can imagine that you've heard sometimes, oh, we don't need a new town hall or we don't need a new community center. We're doing fine the way you are. How do you balance that aspect of the job? Because it seems like you are one who wants the betterment of the community because the Craig of 1991, if he was transplanted into Torbay in 2024, he would not recognize that community, I'm assuming. But no. you are seeing the changes for the better. How do you balance the needs of the individual who don't want the community to change as much with the understanding that the changes that are happening need to happen because that will better the community? I, you know, that is a really, really good question. What I've found, what I've learned over the years, when I first got on council, I, uh, I felt I needed to solve everybody's problem. I had to listen to every complaint, and I still do listen to them. But at that time, being new to that position, looking at it from the outside doesn't give you appreciation for what it is that uh, the decisions you have to make, the things that you have to uh, deal with. So but what I've learned over a period of time is if somebody brings something like that to me that then i have to do my homework i have to expand my reach talk to people social media for that is a great thing and it's also horrible because preach it craig preach it right you can go out and look at uh, a facebook group <laughs> this is a funny story so myself and another lady were running for council in 2013. So we decided to create this group on Facebook called Torbay for Families. We started up and uh, now there's like 4,000 people or 5,000 people in it. And it's basically, for a while, it was just a stick for my own back. After I After the election, it just became a place where People just went to complain about everything all the time. And I used to engage with them, and I still do and to, a, to a certain extent, but not as much as I used to. I've, I've learned over the last number of years to take a step back from the, the vacuum of social media. I... But but I'm going to interject that, here for Jack. I'm yeah. going to interject on that statement because I think this is an important statement. I I this I preach this all the time on the show. Some people only engage on social media. Like if you go to the grocery store, I'm assuming you get stopped on a regular basis and people will talk to you about the issues of the day. But there are some people in this world and maybe in, even in Torbay who don't like to do the interaction, the face-to-face -face interaction. They're willing to just do a social media post or send it to you that way. So what is the line that you have to draw in the sand to say, okay, there is interaction, but there is respectful inter interaction because people do have the right to complain on social media and you sort of have to gauge what they're talking about, but sometimes they they only want to be interacted that way as well. And, and you know what, that's fair, but what I, what I have found and, and what I tell people, so People tag me on 
posts all the time, right? And they're expecting me to answer them. It depends what it depends what it is. Normally, what I will do, if people are having an issue, I will tell them, listen, send me, I'll respond to their post. I'll say, send me an email. This is my email address. Then I can try and address your issue through the proper channels. It's logged. There's a history of it that that you asked. Just because somebody says something on a Facebook post, don't make it uh, all of a sudden uh, town staff and counselors and are going to be watching that to make sure. You know, it's uh, through the pandemic, I think we realized how much vitriol is on Facebook in particular. Twitter, I mean, I used to be active, daily, adamant user of Twitter. I found it an excellent place to have sensible discussions with people, uh, uh, you know. But now, I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's not even fit to look at. And it's really unfortunate because, you know, there, there's a lot of really good people that, uh, you know, put information out there that's great. I, I know that, uh, and to your point, right, about uh, there's a lot of negativity comes with things. There was a point in, I'd have to say, 20, 2014, 2015, 2016, maybe, 2016, 2015, late 2015, where I was contemplating hanging it up. I was done. I was finished. My, uh, I spent many hours and minutes sitting on the couch at a at uh, a psychologist, mental health, getting my get my own mental health in order, because through that number of years, there was just so much negativity around, uh, just in general, you know, and we we had our we had our issues around council and and trying to deal with those and, and uh, you know plus I work a full time job every day people kind of forget that so when I go what do you mean the mayor of Torbay day, doesn't get paid six figures every year come on oh God. <laughs> and sit in my office here at the town hall from nine o'clock to five o'clock every day no I I have a full time job that I work from from uh, nine o'clock to five o'clock every day and then I uh, find time afterwards to do council business and uh you know at at that point things were just uh built up so much i i never had anxiety in my life and then i found that uh at one point i mean it, it was a challenge just to come to the town hall it was a challenge to to face people and, and i know that uh from my interactions with people and i'm very open you're not the first person i've told this to and i i've told to big crowds of people because I want them to understand, particularly people in municipal government, that, you know, times are going to be tough sometimes, but there is a right way to deal with that uh, stresses and, and anxiety and, and there's a wrong way to deal with it. And the right way is to seek out guidance and help and, and try and find someone that can point you in the right direction which is what I did. I know uh, I have a friend that's on a different council. She's a mental health advocate. And I called her up one day, went for a coffee, and we sat down and had a chat. And I uh, I guess I told her what I was going through, what, I was, what was happening. And uh, she gave me the name of a, a wonderful counselor. And I went and uh, had a meeting with her and, and got my uh, figure out first what my issues were. And then figure out ways to cope and, and work through that. I, I mean, I'm, I'm 100% now, but uh, I just, I, I feel bad for people that don't have that uh, that avenue to be able to help them. And I've kind of made it a, I've made a conscious decision when I see somebody struggling like that, and not even on my own counsel, but other counselors, and uh, people from other towns 
and I'll send them a message and I'll ask them, you know, how are you doing today? And, uh, you know, did you want to have a go, have a coffee, have a chat, see how things are going? Because, uh, you know, you can tell when someone's struggling. And, and uh, I think that's a part of uh, municipal government that people don't understand. We don't, I don't have a filter like our MHA or MP. When you send an email to them, they got an executive assistant that goes through it, figures out all the answers, finds out, takes the brunt of the phone calls where people are calling, complaining, swearing sometimes, and and really passionate about what they're saying. And and I think that what you need to remember, and this goes to your point right about a person doesn't want this or doesn't want that. How do you how do you balance that? At that moment, when that person calls you. If they took the time to pick up the phone to give you a call, that issue that they're dealing with right now is the most important one for them at that moment. So you need to treat it that way. And hopefully you can find a way to help that person move forward. Or, and in, in some cases, in a lot of cases, you got to be honest with them. If you can't help somebody, or you already know the answer, don't say to them, oh, I'll look into that for you. Because all you're doing then is giving that person a false sense of hope that something is going to be done. If you already know the answer is going to be no, tell them no at the start, right? Explain Isn't to them. Isn't that going to make the situation worse, though? Because I, I, I would 100% agree with you. I'd rather hear no than some cockamamie lie of oh we'll look into that i i completely understand that but mm -hmm. as a resident who's coming to my municipal counselor or mayor and looking yep. for an answer the last thing i want to hear is no so how right. do you say no to people without making them feel like their issues aren't important <laughs> right and, and and i mean and that's the that's the balancing act and i think that part of it comes with experience and understanding how municipal government works and understanding your development regulations and understanding what it is that your staff can do and what legal authority you have and what legislative levers that you have to be able to do things. The more you know about that, the, the easier or the better you're going to be able to handle that situation because you can't just say no to somebody. You have to have reasoning behind that and, and explain to them. And, you know, sometimes you can't do that over the phone. You have to say to somebody, listen, man, what's your address? I'm going to come over. I'm going to pop over, put the kettle on. I'll be over in a minute and go sit down at their kitchen table and, and uh, have a meeting with them. I'd much rather go and meet you in your kitchen than for you to come sit here in my office at town hall for a bunch of reasons. Number one, it's, it's intimidating for some people to come, to walk into the town hall, to come in and sit in the mayor's office. Not that I'm different than any other person, but if I go to your house and you're going to invite me in, you're going to put on, we're going to have a coffee. Already you have the feeling of the upper hand, say, because you're in your own domain. And I I think that uh, dealing with people like that, where they are, is, is much better than coming in and sitting in a cold office. Now, granted, I meet with people here too, but I think when someone's having a personal issue around their place, you go, you have a look at it, size it up, explain to them why and never i guess make a decision off collar but gather some information and then you know figure out the best way to go forward and, and uh you know it's it's kind of funny i remember uh, my first term as mayor and uh, i had some new counselors came out and i told them i said listen i could write you down now five names on a piece of paper of people who are going to contact you and tell you that they've got this issue and the town will never do anything about it. And uh, 
guaranteed they're going to contact you and you're going to spend hours and days and weeks chasing this stuff down and you're going to have staff running around doing these things that's already been done and the next election if the stuff is if for whatever reason it hasn't been done you're going to be able to take those five names and write them down and give them someone new coming in the door because rightly or wrongly people don't necessarily understand the like i said the power that a elected counselor or mayor has to do things we can't just do whatever we want and i think that uh, people misunderstand that sometimes I think that uh, i can just come in here to the town hall tell the staff what to do i mean that's not my job right my job is a legislator to create policies to create to do make decisions of governance and allow the staff to do their job and you know that that's how this level of government is supposed to work and that's when it works the best when members of council start to meddle too far down into the into the weeds and the everyday operations of the, of a municipality that is only a recipe for disaster this conversation is fascinating and i apologize for interrupting here but i i am cautious of time here but I still want to continue this. So hopefully you have an extra 10 minutes for this interview because this is such a fascinating conversation so far. I want to pick up on what you just said there and I, because I think it's an important part of the story. How often are you finding yourself explaining the jurisdictional roles of the municipality compared to the other levels of government? So when a resident comes to you, you are the closest to them. They know who you are. They've invited you into their house. But they're not talking to you about just the sewer, the waters, the roads, the parks. They're talking about health care. They're talking about education. They're talking about things that are not even in the jurisdictional purview of the municipality. How do you how do you sort of deal with issues outside your jurisdiction? Because, again, they're coming to you to try to fix them because you're their elected official. How do you balance the jurisdictional role with understanding that your MHA or your MP are going to have to get involved. And sometimes your phone call is going to get them on the phone compared to their phone call, the residents. Right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. That is a great example because <laughs> in our town here, we have a, we have multiple provincial roads. So the, the road that runs right past the town hall here, Torbay road is provincial jurisdiction. We have, so we got, Torbay How road, many complaints a year do you get about that road? I can imagine. Lots, <laughs> Lots right? Potholes, snow clearing, whatever. So we, and they're major thoroughfares. Enemy line, Balling line, where I live, provincial roads. So we're always the first point of contact. How come this? How come that? And then usually what I do in those cases, and, and that's a... Uh, a really good example of when I tell people you need to send me an email on this because I'm going to send your, e I'm going to take your email and I am going to put it to the people where it needs to go with the MP or the MHA or our staff will follow up with department in, in department transportation with the province on your behalf. And you should also do it as well. And then, uh, but normally we get the, a lot of these complaints from people within our town that might have only moved here two years ago, last year, last month, don't understand that every road in the town is not owned by the town. So there's a certain amount of education that has to happen there. And I, I think that uh, us as municipal government, we have an obligation to be able to explain this to those people so that uh, they are directing their inquiries to the right place. So, you know, it's, uh, I know that I had, I had complaints last week about snow clearing on Pine Line, Provincial Road. How come it's plowed over an outer road? It's not plowed in Torbay. So, you know, I uh, asked the person to email me, reached out to the MHA. He got it all looked after. So it's, it's better to work that way. And that's why it's so important for us at the municipal government level. Everybody knows that we're the first line of 
you know, it's a like say we're a, a, I hate that we're a shit screen for the provincial government. First thing, <laughs> you know, we take all we take all that, and uh, by the time it gets to them, the people are tend to be calmed down a little bit because we've taken the brunt of that. And you know, it's uh, fortunately our uh, since I've been around here, the MHAs that we've had, the one that we have now, Jody Wall and Ken Parsons before him. We're really good to work with and and uh, and help us out a great bit. Same with our with our MP. But uh, to that to that example, our post office was closing here in Torbay last year, and of course we received petitions and phone calls and and everything from residents about the post office closing, and move it was moving to a different area of town. So myself, deputy mayor, a couple of others, uh, some of our staff. Uh, we advocated at that time for those residents. We went to Canada Post, met with them several times to find out what the issue was, why they were moving, make sure they were putting out proper uh, notifications. Uh, you know, and, and I think that we couldn't stop it because it is outside of our jurisdiction. But it is still, you know, it's it's still worth my time and effort to try and help out those residents who had that issue that wanted to find out more information about it. And it was important to the town just because something is outside of our jurisdiction doesn't mean that it's uh, that it's not going to negatively affect the residents. So if something's going to negatively affect the residents, then we should uh, advocate. It doesn't hurt to make a phone call or send an email and uh, find out what's going on. I'm more likely to get an answer, and this is shocking the way it, that, that it is that way, when an email comes from me and it says at the bottom, Mayor Scott Town Torbay, Newfoundland Labrador, then Joe Blow from, you know, Torbay Road, Newfoundland Labrador. You are not the <laughs> first and only councillor or mayor who has ever said that to me on this show, and it's shocking that, uh, unfortunately, you sort of have to throw the title around from time to time to get attention on some issues. As we're talking about issues, I want to turn to Torbay as a whole for a second, if you don't mind. And I want to start this line of questioning with this statement. This is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the mayor's opinion. He has one vote of seven on council. He needs a majority to pass anything. So, yeah. so Mayor Scott... In your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing Torbay today? Oh my God! Come out with the softballs. That was that that question to me is so easy, and so and the issue is so difficult. So our water supply is at max capacity right now, and it. Over the last, it's and it's been that way now for quite some time. Uh, it was pretty close before I got on council. It's it's to the point now where we have to sit around when an application comes in, and we have a policy in place to deal with one water allocation or two. Where's it going to go? It's it's so frustrating and and demoralizing at, at the same time that, you know, such a basic uh, amenity as water with water sewer that uh, we don't have it. A large portion of our town, probably two thirds, is large lot subdivisions on their own well and septic, right? I, I, at my house, my own well and septic, it's a it's a draw for people who move to our town from different areas of the province where they're more used to having their ATVs and their screws and trailers. And they want to have a three quarter acre lot or one acre lot and, and their house and all that stuff. That's fine. But in the core of our town, where we'd like to be able to develop more dense, densely, plus encourage more commercial growth 
right here behind Town Hall now, we got a huge, uh, it's a gym. It's a place overlooking the bay, beautiful views uh, that we have a plan in place to build a town center there with shopping and condos, apartments and everything that you'd want that would be in a downtown area of a town. And we can't even look at it because our water capacity is is an issue. So over the last number of years, certainly I and, and council, we've been working, we're trying to get onto the regional water system. We finally got an answer back from that, that we can't get on because the trunk line or whatever in Portugal was not big enough, blah, blah, blah. And they're looking at uh, expanding their own water system. But I guess the most frustrating part for me is we had another water supply, a few hundred feet from our current one, that there was a plan to run a pipe there, connect those two ponds together, and that would have looked after our capacity issues for years to come. However, the watershed of that pond is inside the airport authority. <laughs> and over the years, Back in probably 70s, 80s, the fire department used to train up there at the airport and heavy metal contaminants got into the watershed and basically contaminated our pond, right? Our additional one. Now, luckily, it didn't contaminate the one that we're using now, but the because the two watersheds are separated by a ridge. So the federal government contaminated our water supply. And now we're looking at, we have to develop a new one, which we're looking at now and actively moving forward with a lot of the work. But, you know, that's a big hefty price tag for us to have to develop a whole new water source when we really didn't have to. So we're- so can, I, can I ask the million dollar follow-up question here for a second? And that is, uh, Torbay seems to be growing. It seems to be growing at a great rate, a, a rate that many municipalities across this country would probably be envious of. But growth cannot happen without infrastructure. Infrastructure is water. Yeah. It sounds like, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here, it sounds like Torbay is coming to the end of a road and there is no exit. There is no right. way that... Torbay is able to move forward because the road is just going to stop and you're going to be at a dead end. What do I, you I, have to do in the short term to make sure that that doesn't happen? Right. So I think that we actually came to that road <laughs> a, num a number of years ago. And we've been sustaining ourselves on large lot development, like I said, uh, in the meantime. But Right now, we're in the process of a project to put water treatment on our current water supply because it's not treated, it gets chlorinated, but we're building a water treatment plant there. We've already started to move forward with studies on, and we're well into it on this another water supply within our town that we're going to develop and we're moving forward with that too. Uh, we have no choice. We have to. But in the meantime, we've also reached out to our federal MP and said, hang on now. You guys contaminate our water supply. We're expending tens of millions of dollars to, to develop a new one that we shouldn't have to. So is there anywhere, any possible way that you can help us out with that? So we're in the early stages of that. We've sent all the information to our MP. She sent it off to the departments. This is something that we've been working on for a long time, back and forth with the federal government. It's uh, it's difficult because you know there's a, there's a fine uh, kind of balancing act, I guess, for lack of a better word, that you got to play there. You, we can't be too forceful and and we can't be too mild and meek, you know. We but to me, the best way forward with that is present them with the facts of what we have, with the studies and and everything that we have done, and then. Uh, and see what they say, you know, if, uh, we have to ask, regardless of that, we still have to move forward and we're going to have to develop that water supply. And, uh, you know, that will enable us to grow the right way, 
the way that we want to, the way that we want to be able to add additional businesses to our town. We're never going to be able to compete with the city of St. John's. We're on our doorstep. You drive out of Torbay, you're in St. John's. Everybody does their, most people do their shopping. It's it's a it's a two minute drive. Like, you know, it's, so we have to approach it smartly and make sure we're developing the right types of businesses. And we just had a new tap house open uh, this summer in Torbay in the old post office as a, you know, so that post office moving out opened up the opportunity for the post tap house to open overlooking Torb. It's it's a tremendous place. If you ever come down, I'll bring you over and get you a beer. I'll be but, there this uh, summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll go there then. And so, uh, but I, I, want, we, we get, I, I get accused on this show a lot of only talking about the negative things that are going on in a municipality. And I understand yep. that the, the negative things are the ones that most people are concerned about. But the things that don't often get sort of talked about are the accomplishments, are the things that municipalities do right and boast about. For you, when you go to MNL, when you speak with FCMM members across Canada, what's the thing you boast about when it comes to Torbay? What is the thing that you guys do right? And yes, it's another softball question, but I think it's the most important softball question I ask municipal I, leaders. I think it's I think it's awesome. And if you Google or anybody that watches this Google's uh, Torbay attraction video, they will see a video that we had done a number of years ago. It was shot over the course of a whole year. It shows every season. Well, we only got two seasons here, like kind of winter and kind of summer. Construction. Everything, <laughs> and it's, everything is a mishmash in between. Nah, it's beautiful here. And, uh, you know, it's original song. It's original video. It, it showcases our town. It's uh, it's tremendous. I was at FCM the first time I went there, and I uh, I'm always looking for opportunities, right? So I went up to the guy at the uh, the sound booth, audio guy that's playing the songs and the videos up on the screen, and I said, "Buddy, you got the internet on that?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Do his favor, will you?" He said, "What?" I said, "Go out here and Google this." Can you play that video up there on that screen? And sure enough, what he did it. And then I had him play it a couple of more times before the conference was over. So any opportunity that I get to promote our town, I do it. I'm on the MNL board. So I I do have an opportunity there to uh, to try and 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 in that role I try and promote all towns in particular large urban municipalities, because that's who I represent on the board. But uh, And I'm also part of Atlantic Mayor's Congress, so I get to, to go there and, and learn from from them. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's eye-opening sometimes what some of these municipalities are doing, the, the positive things that they're doing. And then we bring it here and we have to adapt it for what we're doing. Last year was the 50th anniversary of incorporation of Torbay. We had a, the whole year, we started in January, February, whatever, and started doing uh, Torbay 50 events. We had 50 events, and I went to all 50. And I was some, that was something I was really proud of. I, I, I went to everything. Even if two were going on at the same time, I managed to go to one for a little while and go to the other one. To me, as a mayor or a, a municipal councillor that is one of my jobs like that's one of my main jobs is to go to events the town's doing and talk to people and let them see me and talk to me and, and get feedback from them what do you think of this is this good or is it not good what do you think you should do better if if people think that you run for election you get your seat you come to the council chamber every two weeks for a meeting and then go home and that's it if that is your idea of sitting on a council don't do it stay home because it's more to it than that and i think that people who are really passionate about their town they don't need to be told that they will go because you know why they go to these events because they went to them before they were on a council and they'll go to them after and they enjoy being around people and I think that uh, 
People underestimate that sometimes, the amount of work that's involved. And in in most cases, in Newfoundland Labrador in particular, most councils are almost fully volunteer. We do get a remuneration here, but it's not, uh, I mean, I got still got to work to to be able to, to have a house and kids and all that kind of stuff, you know. So I don't know, will it, for a town our size, would it ever come to a place where you could have full-time councillor or even a full-time mayor? I don't know. But, uh, you know, there's an amount of work there. I'd love to be able to uh, to come in here in the office every day and, and interact with people and staff and, and kind of have the pulse of what's going on. Not that I don't, because I come here almost all the time anyway. I drop in the daytime or I'll come here in the nighttime and do my work. And, and uh, you know, I'm always, luckily now with technology, people are always available. And uh, I, I think that's really important because if you look at the dynamic and here in Newfoundland Labrador, it's, it's, uh, it's, I guess even more pronounced. Most councils are older, retired people that have time to be able to uh, run, do the business of the, of the town. And, you know, I'm fortunate here. We have very professional and excellent staff that uh, do everything. I feel bad for members of council, mayors and councillors in towns of 150 people and 200 people where they don't have money to have a staff person. You know, things need to be done. The member of council has to do it. And I think that uh, people are not wired that way anymore. You know, it's uh, if you want to be able to attract younger people, they have to be able to see some value in what it is that they're doing. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's getting getting more and more difficult all the time. And I hear this too from uh, mayors and councillors from uh, not just from Newfoundland Labrador, but from from the Atlantic provinces as well. I, I am as well. I want to turn to a subject you've been sort of skirting a little bit, but I want to put put, put it on the record here. And this is my favorite subject, and that is tourism. I think tourism is a great economic driver. I think it's something that municipalities should do more about. Now, you've mentioned a few spots, Post, Tap House, mm -hmm. the new building. What are some of the other tourism destinations that you tell people, if you come to Torbay, you need to go see X, Y, and Z? Right. So over the last number of years, I guess whenever they developed it, the East Coast Trail runs right through our town. Right along, it comes right along our shoreline, goes down to our uh, Captain William Amherst Monument, because Torbay Beach is a historic location. And we just recently, a couple of years ago, we developed a new monument down there. The monument itself used to be at our war memorial, and we moved it back down to the beach where it should be, because Amherst landed there in 1860-something and marched from here to St. John's to retake St. John's from the French. So that, that's kind of a, a little niche thing that we have. Uh, our Folk Arts Council has a new uh, stage down at the beach that we built uh, early last year. So there's always entertainment on the go. The, uh, we have trails going through our subdivisions and our towns. And I think that uh, last year, it's almost two years ago now, we opened up our new History House and Museum. So our council in my first term purchased the old uh, Roman Catholic priest house, we call it, was directory. And uh, with the intention of turning it into a museum and history house. And that's what we did. And uh, we've got some really interesting things there. We have the uh, Mummers collection that we purchased from M Morrill University. That's, uh, I tell people, and I'm sure it is. It's probably the largest mummers collection of mummers artifacts in the world. Because wow. mummers are not everywhere, but they're in Newfoundland, and we got and we got the uh, huge uh, display there. We also last year entered into a partnership with uh, Dr. Mannion and his wife from Memorial University on this thing called the Mannion Project, 
And basically what he's done over 50 years or more, collected information on Irish uh, settlement in Newfoundland. And uh, he had it all wrote down on little cue cards, like bigger than this, you know, type, right? And uh, part of it is digitized. Most of it is digitized. And uh, so we have that collection now at our at our history house. And we have it online so that people can go on and search up their name and look at their lineage and, and when their families came to uh, not just Torbay, but the Northeast Avalon, different areas of the province and uh, when they arrived and, and just learn about their families. So that is, a, that is a great attraction for us. Plus we have a gallery upstairs where we have local art and it's for sale. It's, it's really turned into a, a hub, I guess, or for tourism and culture in our town. There's a stage out back where we have all kinds of shows going on there all the time, and there's a beautiful garden, and we got a memorial there for the first mayor who was uh, killed in a plane crash, and there's there's a lot of interesting things to to see here, and uh, you know it's uh, and I haven't even talked about just the ocean. It's right there, the beach and the say. ocean. And, you know, it's like uh, there's just so much to to do here, and. You know, we're right on the doorstep of St. John's. So people, it's funny, right? I'm good friends, too, with the with Danny Green, the mayor of St. John's, and then the other mayors around here, too. And I never begrudge the city for doing something or getting something. Because I look at that and I'd say, if it's good for St. John's, it's good for us. And if Flat Rock or one of the other towns around here get something, it's good for us because people are, are going to be attracted to that. They're going to come. And when they come there, they're going to be looking to what else is, can we do? And we have to make sure that we build those partnerships with St. John's, Mount Pearl, Portra Coast, St. Phillips, Outer Cove, the towns around here on our Killy Coast that we call it. And, you know, Make sure we get the word out that uh, we're here. There's stuff to do here. You can do a day trip here. You can drive down here for an hour. You can go see this. You can go to the tap house. You can go to to a coffee house here and get a uh, get a homemade sandwich or or whatever. So we always had to be. I feel like I'm a salesman all the time wherever I go. Right. I'm. I went to the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, and they were looking for a place to host. So you know what? I'll host. So I went back to my council and I said, I'd like to host Atlantic Mayor's Congress here in Torbay. And it was one of the first things that we hosted at our new community center. They couldn't get over uh, the, I guess, the, the agenda and, and what it is that we were able to do for such a small town. And, I mean, even the bus driver who was driving, because, of course, we have no hotels here in Torbay. The mayor's all had to stay in St. John's. And we had a bus bringing them back and forth. And the bus driver took them on a tour of the town, drove them all around, this that place, this that place. That's where the mayor lives, right? And uh, <laughs> they came to me the, more, the next morning and said, hey, the bus driver showed us where your house was. <laughs> Last night, driving us around, looking at just looking at your town. So I thought that was pretty cool. It was nice to see, you know, the mayor of Halifax here in Torbay for, for a conference. You know, it's... Uh, it's great that we were able to do that and, uh, you know, kind of put us on the map a little bit. And uh, I, I think that's great. I'm, I'm always trying to sell the town. Well, you've sold it to me, and I, I'm looking forward in 2024 to visiting Torbay. I've made a pledge on this show that if in 2024 I'm visiting 600 communities and 10 of them, 10 of each from each province must be visited. So Torbay will be on the map in 2024 to come visit. Hopefully yeah. we can get a photo. Um, but before I let you go, I have one last question. And I started off talking about you with your duty to serve. I'm ending on the town of Torbay because it seems like you're a big advocate for it. And I want to ask, what makes Torbay such a unique place? I think that... Uh... I think we have a long history here. 
the uh, I guess the the combination of rural and urban that we have in our town is a is a good mix, and I think that uh, you know we have a pretty diverse population. Our population is on the younger side for uh, for a municipality in our in our province that has an aging that has an aging population. We had some census work done, and you know our our household income is on the higher end. So, you know, there's a there's a lot to do here. There are a lot of opportunities. There's uh, you can come live here. You can li see that that's the beauty of this, right? You can live in Torbay and work in St. John's. I work in Mount Pearl, but I I live in Torbay, and you know it only takes me fifteen minutes in the morning to get to work, depending on on traffic and stuff. But I don't have, and, I, and listen, I know what to compare to. I lived in a fairly big city when I lived in Ottawa. Uh, big in terms of what what we have here in, in Newfoundland. There's, we don't have, I mean, St. John's is the biggest city we got. It's like a, it's, it's not that. Uh, like a suburb of Ottawa, if I'm not mistaken. It It, it is. And, and, you know, I think that, um, I don't know that people really appreciate how the pace of life here is really uh, is really something to behold when when you look at if I had to sit in traffic for ten minutes coming home or going out of town or whatever that's no big deal. I know people that work in Toronto that's, that are in traffic for two hours going back and forth to work every day, which is to me insane. And when I get, when I get home and I look and I haul into my yard of my house where I got a half acre property and I got a big backyard and, and, you know, I got room to do things and beyond the fence is the woods. And, you know, so I think that if, if you want to have a balanced lifestyle, where you can have all the common modern amenities that that you want, but then go out in your yard, jump on the skidoo, and go in the woods, or on your bike, go cut wood, or go fishing, or trouting, or or do whatever. I think that uh, that's something that people, when they come here and visit, and particularly from Ontario, I've had I've had friends of mine come here from Ontario and Alberta. And, uh, you know, they just can't get over. They can't get over the beauty of the ocean, the the lack of flatness here. If you had to try and find a, a piece of flat land around here, it's almost impossible. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, just a, it's just a great place to live. And, you know, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here because I was in Ottawa two stretches. I spent 10 years living there. I loved it. I loved the city of Ottawa. I loved living there. It was just big enough that it wasn't too many people. There was lots of things going on. I lived south of the city, so I was kind of in a suburban type area. But there's still something about this place that draws you back and, and wants you to be here. And if you look at our video, and if anybody's watching this, and look at that video and look it up. Torbay attraction video. When you watch it, you will understand what it is that I'm talking about. For those who, hopefully, this is okay with the town of Torbay and the mayor. But for those who are watching this right now, for those who are listening, go over to our YouTube channel because hopefully we're going to be able to play the attraction video right after this interview, right before the credits. So I would highly recommend you guys do that because. Prior to the interview with the mayor, I actually did look, <laughs> I Googled Torbay and it didn't come up. So ah, I knew exactly right. what you were talking about. 
Um, but Mayor Scott, I want to thank you. I want to thank, I said 45 minutes, we're at the hour mark. So thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure to sit down with you. And like I said, I am so looking forward to visiting Torbay in 2024 and visiting you and meeting you in person and shaking your hand and hopefully having a coffee, not in my house because mine's in Calgary, yours is in Torbay, but I'm not, right. I'm not jealous of any mayor's office. So hopefully we can do it there. That's it. Listen, I, I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and like I said, any opportunity that I get that I can talk about my town and my my place in it, I don't necessarily always want to talk about myself, but I think that people have to understand where you're coming from to understand where it is that you want to go, like your your vision. So uh, I really, really, really appreciate this. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it uh, being broadcast. I'm going to share it. I'm going to ask people to have a look and uh, see what they think. There's something in the water that makes you want to stay. There's something in the air that just makes everything okay There's something in the people that makes them family There's something in the water and I never want to leave Ooh -oh -oh. Today's episode sparked your interest. Hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to in depth conversations like the cross border interviews and even the eye opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We're your go to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well informed and engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and our maintenance of this top-notch content that you have come to love. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and breadth of our programming. Find our support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website. 
Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.